So I just completed a cruise on Carnival's newest ship to Alaska, and while Alaska was amazing and beautiful as usual, I have to admit my time on board the ship was, well, disappointing. The reason for this disappointment was due to the price, the overall general operations, and Carnival themselves not exactly being so honest, which I'm going to go in great detail in this video slash review. By the way, I hate that I have to say this before I even start the video, but for all of you carnival lovers out there, you are going to have to suck it up on this one. I know you love carnival and carnival can do no wrong and all their ships are amazing. However, in my personal opinion, unless you have sailed on this ship to Alaska without casino comp rates, meaning you're living in the casino for the entire cruise, you don't really have much to say when it comes to this particular ship. Not every product has to be loved just because you love carnival. It's like Apple products. Do I love iPhone? Sure. Am I going to get that $3,500 VR headset that basically does nothing? Absolutely not. You get my point. Now let's begin. The ship that I will be sailing on would be known as the Carnival Luminosa. She was built in the year 2009 and at that time it was owned by Carnival's Italian line Costa Cruises. In 2022 she was transferred over to Carnival Cruise Line and then did a dry dock where it would be repainted and refurbished. Once that was done it was known as the Carnival Luminosa. She has 12 decks and holds just over 2200 passengers. The price that I would pay for this 7 night Alaskan cruise would be $3,900. This would include all the port taxes taxes and fees, as well as gratuities, aka tips. The price would include a standard balcony or stateroom cabin, as well as four stops or calls in Alaska and Canada. Now FYI, just for reference and context, because naturally as somebody that cruises a lot with many different lines, I do somewhat compare. Literally at the same time last year as I took this cruise, I took my mom on Royal Caribbean's Ovation of the Seas. I got a junior suite for around the same price, and even if you were to look on Royal Caribbean's site right now, considering I paid just about $4,000 for this cruise, you can find itineraries for 7 days from June and July for less than that price. I've also cruised on Carnival's newest ship, The Celebration, I was one of the first passengers on board, for a 14 day transatlantic. 14 days, not 7, and I paid $4,300, so $300 or so more than the price that I paid for this Alaskan cruise. Just keep that in mind as we move forward. On embarkation day or the first day of my cruise as my ship was sailing out of Seattle, of course I had to go check out the Space Needle. Upon arrival to the port, I gotta say, overall, it was a pretty smooth process. The only problem that I had, well, I wouldn't even call it a problem, it was something that I've never seen before. There were no porters to take my bag, so I had to take my giant bag all the way up the terminal and on board the ship. Like I said, not a huge problem, but my check-in time was 2 o'clock. The porters were all then and gone by the time I arrived. All I gotta say is I wish Carnival had contacted me and told me that I could come earlier in order to get my bag on board instead of carrying it all over the ship because I couldn't go straight to my room. I did unfortunately or fortunately have to go check into my muster drill. That way I kind of got it out of the way and from there I went straight over to my room. Once I arrived in my room, the room itself as far as the aesthetics was not horrible. I would say it would look like anything you typically see on any older to middle aged Carnival ship. However, there was only one outlet for a refurbished ship, meaning only one place over by the mirror on the desk to plug in your electronics and charge your devices. The balcony wasn't as clean as I would have hoped it would have been, even though I don't really spend a lot of time on the balcony, so I didn't really take that into consideration. The toilet itself had a 50-50 chance of flushing, and I wasn't the only one on board. There were a lot of posts on our Facebook group for the Carnival Luminosa that was being posted left and right, and many people said they had the same problem. Some people said the toilet wasn't flushing at all. I also had a situation situation where my heater in my room broke three times. Keep in mind this is an Alaskan cruise so it was extremely cold. They came in those three times and fixed it. One time took a little bit longer than expected so they gave me a blanket and well, I had to kind of work it out that way. Once again, just a reminder, not only did I pay $4,000 for this stateroom and this cruise as a whole, this ship was also said to be refurbished and, well, updated for the upcoming sailings that were going to take place in Alaska and throughout all of 2023. So at that point in time, naturally, I was asking myself, considering what I paid for a Royal Caribbean ship that was newer and had more amenities, was that $4,000 price tag worth it? Exploring the Carnival Luminosa, I have to admit that it didn't exactly give off the Carnival fun ship feel. Now, a lot of people argue that this ship is supposed to be an Italian style ship because it came from the Italian line over in Europe, Costa. However, from my understanding, the ships that are supposed to have the Italian vibe would be the other two former Costa ships, both the Venezia and the Firenze. So maybe I'm wrong, somebody correct me in the comment section, but around there it just looked kind of like a little bit of a mess in my personal opinion, especially considering the ship was supposed 
supposed to be updated and refurbished. There was artwork in my room as well as around the ship that had private parts all over the place. There was that naked iron lady thing, which I thought was pretty interesting. A lot of people rubbed the, the right butt cheek for good luck or whatever the case may be. But either way, it was just a very different feel than what you would see on traditional carnival ships. Some people may like it, some people may not, and well, that's just what it is. It kind of had that old school, funky carnival feel and style, which I honestly love. I love that about the older carnival ships, mixed in with a little bit of Costa, but it looks like it wasn't intentional. This little mix up and collaboration looks like it was just kind of, in my opinion, laziness of stuff that was just left there that carnival didn't want to remove whenever they did the refurbishment and update. The venues were nice on board, the Limelight Lounge, Ocean Plaza, the nightclub on board, Serenity Deck, all that stuff you typically see on the ship, and there were plenty of lounging areas. The top deck was extremely uneventful. There was a basketball court, however, it unfortunately got broken somehow in the middle of the cruise, so they had to shut it all down. But there were plenty of viewing areas, which I would argue, only for this type of itinerary would that actually be a really amazing thing, considering that no matter where you went on the top deck, you could see the beautiful and pretty stuff. It's Alaska, so there's mountains and glaciers and whales all over the place, so it created the perfect environment. However, considering the ship is going to other itineraries and repositioning the places like back over to Alaska, where it originally came, Carnival, it wouldn't be too bad of an idea to maybe put a water slide or two over in those areas in the future. Also on the top deck, there were strange heavy passenger doors that were completely unmarked and had a 50-50 chance of being unlocked. Some would lead to bars, some would lead over to the pool deck area, but like I said, you never knew if they were open or not. And there were also a couple venues around the ship that I honestly believe during the refurbishment and the updating could have been utilized a little better. Especially if you're going to like an Alaskan itinerary, you could have used one of those areas for like, for example, another bar or maybe serving hot cocoa. Just a suggestion. The food was absolutely mid-tier at best, and I'm not a big foodie. However, I do love Carnival's restaurants and food venues that they have on board almost more than any other cruise ship, especially if you're talking about like their newer XL class ships, like of course the Mardi Gras celebration and soon to come out later on this year, Jubilee. However, I was very disappointed. On this ship, there was no pizza pirate, there was no guy's burgers, there was no blue iguana, there was no seafood shack, all of which I absolutely love. Instead, they had the eBay versions. For guys, they had off the grill. They had uh, a tacos and burritos for Blue Agana. They had the seafood corner instead of the seafood shack. And well, I don't even remember the name of the pizza place. I think it was just called like Pizzeria or something, or Capitano. It, it just, it was very, very strange to see that. And I was actually curious as to why they made those decisions as opposed to maybe doing an Italian vibe to those, an Italian twist, or maybe just keeping them to what people traditionally know as the food venues on board. I tried to go to the main dining room one night, but I gave up because I ended up waiting there for about an hour and I still couldn't get in. However, keep in mind, this was on Elegant Night, the fancy night, so maybe everybody was trying to go over to that place for a nice free meal. I did also go to Fahrenheit 555 Steakhouse and, well, there were 15 people there. However, I ended up being there two hours getting all of my courses of meals. A little long away from me personally, and I would say as far as the venue and the aesthetics, it was not nowhere near what you would see on any other carnival ship, whether it be an older ship or even a newer one. It just looked to me like they just kind of found an area where they could put this steakhouse and just kind of threw it over there. The entertainment and nightlife was not horrible for an Alaskan cruise, just not exactly present. They had two production shows on board and well, they only had them for one night. The rest of the time, they either kept the venue dark or they saved that venue for Love and Marriage, which is always fun as usual. The bands were okay. They were decent. Comedian was not bad. I will always say that Carnival either has the best or worst comedian. However, in this case, I would say the comedians overall were good, not great. As far as things to do later on in the evening, there really wasn't much. There was the casino, which in this particular case, the entire ship was over there, and there was the nightclub. The nightclub, as you could expect was extremely disappointing. I want to say for with the exception of like one night and that was the night before our sea day that we had during our cruise and even then I got in a little bit of trouble for the first time ever not just on carnival ships on all the ships that I have sailed on, I have never gotten in trouble for dancing. Most of you know I am a professional break dancer. I used to be a dancer with Carnival for a very short time, Norwegian and Virgin, even though I never made it on the ship. However, I did work for all of these lines as a break dancer and street performer. I started dancing, and keep in mind at this venue, as you could imagine, there is nobody there. 
I want to say on the busiest night where there was maybe like 15 people there, I started breakdancing. Me and this other guy had a little fun dance battle. Older guy. He was still shaking a tail feather. And sure enough, security comes up to me and says, hey, if you do that again, we're going to kick you out. And honestly, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I didn't argue back with him, but I told him straight up, I have done this on every other carnival ship that I've been on. The Mardi Gras, the Celebration, the Paradise, the Conquest. And in fact, whether it be any of the MCs, the DJ, or even the cruise director, they are all hyping those moments up because they want people to have fun. And I have spatial awareness. I'm not hitting anybody. I'm nowhere near anybody. I'm not doing anything crazy. This ship was not rocking. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, that really just grind my gears. Personally, I was just going to keep going and see if I got kicked out, but however, this is my brand we're talking about. It would have been an interesting video, but I try to be a good boy when I'm on these ships, but I'm telling you, that rubbed me the wrong way. The ports of call were beautiful as always. I had been to most of these just a year ago when I took my mom on board Royal Caribbean's Ovation of the Seas. However, I do feel like for this particular itinerary and sailing on board the Carnival Luminosa, after Skagway, Alaska, I feel like we kind of got cheated out of our time in these ports. In Skagway, we were there from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. This is typically somewhat customary in the ports of call whenever you sail over to Alaska. They spend a lot of time in these ports. Over there, I bought the most expensive excursion that you could buy, which was the dog sledding and helicopter tour. Absolutely amazing, unforgettable experience. I will indeed do it again if I go back to Skagway on an Alaska cruise next year. Do I think that $700 are worth it? No. Do I understand why when it comes to fueling the chopper and going to see the dogs that are living on a glacier? I understand. I do wish it was just a little bit cheaper though. When we got over to Juneau, this is where the disappointment started to kind of take place. Now, there were a lot of ships in port that day. There were some Holland American ships. There were some Princess ships. I had friends that were on board that I planned on meeting. However, we were originally set to be there from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m., but this ended up going into a tender port, meaning we did not dock like the rest of the ships. We docked just off, and then they had our lifeboats take us over to the spot where we were supposed to get off over in Juneau. I didn't get there until about 8.30. I went whale watching, which was amazing. We saw the Mendenhall Glacier, which was cool. I like going to that national park. But we were set to leave an hour earlier than originally slated at 2 o'clock. This caused a giant train wreck, as I saw literally everyone on the ship trying to get back on the tender boat at around 2 o'clock, which created a massive line. And I kid you not, it looked like, and I would be, I would bet, if I was a betting man, I would say the entire ship was in that line waiting, just waiting to get back on the tender boat. And the ship wasn't loaded up until I want to say about an hour and a half, two hours later. And we didn't leave until four o'clock. I would just say Carnival, I understand that time is money in these ports, but sometimes it's better off to spend the money. If we are there later, people are going to trickle back in and you don't have that chaotic traffic of a mess that we had to deal with over in Juneau. Catch a can was quick too. We're slated to be there from 7 a.m. to 1 a.m. Now, just keep in mind, these things do fluctuate by about 30 minutes or so. That is normal. We weren't able to get off until around 7.30. We had to be back at 12.30. I did, unfortunately, oversleep due to working most of the night and missing a piece of my excursion that I paid $200 for. However, Carnival said they could either reimburse me the 100% of what I paid or I could just take the other half, which was the Lumberjack show, and pay $51. I decided to go that route, and I got some food, and I was back on the ship. To me, that was no problem. One thing I did experience for the first time ever was known as a Jones Act stop. If you guys don't know what the Jones Act is, in a nutshell, just imagine you have a closed loop cruise where you are going to go from one place, like Seattle in our example, you have to return by law, maritime law, international federal law, you got to return back over to Seattle. However, according to law, the cruise ship must stop in a foreign port before returning to its place of origin. So in order to do that, and only to do that, the Carnival Luminosa decided to go to Victoria, and we would only be there from 8 p.m., until midnight. Naturally, walking around the ship and talking to as many people as I do, and many of you know I am a talker. This isn't just me and my YouTube personality. I'm a very social person. This is how I'm able to gather all this information. And well, I talked to, I kid you not, hundreds of people on board the ship, and they all told me the same thing, that they were also very disappointed because a lot of them, unfortunately, didn't look at the final print of the itinerary whenever we were sailing away. And they assumed that when they saw Victoria and British Columbia, that we would be there during the day when all the venues and everything were open. And it just didn't exactly work out. However, I was able to get my Tim Hortons, my Tim bit. If you guys ever go over to Tim Hortons, go get the honey dipped Tim bits. And if you're ever over on the other side, the east side of, of over in Toronto in that area in Halifax, make sure you go check out and get some poutine. They got a place over there called Smokes. You can get chicken, bacon, ranch, poutine. I'm getting off topic. I'm sorry. Let's continue. 
overall, as much as I hate to compare, we all know that the big three are in competition with one another. Of course, Carnival Norwegian and Royal Caribbean. And then you could, in theory, separate Virgin, Princess, Holland America, and Celebrity as they are all what you would call premium lines. And of course, you got the luxury down the way. But considering at the exact same time, I took a Royal Caribbean cruise, I took a Carnival cruise, and typically Royal Caribbean can be a little bit more pricier than Carnival, but I paid the same price and got two separate experiences, which by the way, you can watch on my channel, Jay the Nomad, as well as this channel. I have all the vlogs of me having the time of my life. Did I have fun on the Carnival Luminosa? Yes. As far as the price, $4,000, would I say it was worth it? Absolutely not. But keep in mind, this is my opinion and the opinions of many others on board. So for those of you, once again, like I said at the beginning of the video, you carnival lovers that are going to get mad and say that I'm just hating on carnival or I'm being negative, look, go walk the plank. I, I really don't care. It just appears to me that unfortunately carnival hyped up these Costa carnival hybrids and well, a lot of people got that confused, myself included. I have no shame in saying with the Luminosa thinking it was going to be this brand new retrofitted and upgraded ship and it just wasn't. I was extremely disappointed. If I had known that this, I wouldn't have even sailed on that ship. However, I'm going to be on the other ones. Next week, I'll be on the Carnival Venenzi. I've been invited to the pre-party, and I'll be on board that ship for four whole days. And, well, I'll go over all the prices and giplets and experience on that one as well when the cruise has concluded. And you can also check out my other channel, Jay the Nomad, for all of my real-time vlogs, like the boarding day and my experience on board and all that jazz. But, of course, if you guys have sailed on the Carnival Luminosa, let me know in the comment section below. If you've heard anything, let me know. If you want to hate, I'll see if I can get over to you, because I'll tell you right now, I'm a troll myself. I can hang with the best of them. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I appreciate all of you guys. I love all of you. Hit that like button on your way out, and well, I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.